Okay, let's get started. The end is nigh, who would have thought? A little less than a month to go. So, uh, you're working on deliverable three. Starting on Tuesday, you're gonna start in on your A-B testing. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about A-B testing on Tuesday, but just as you start to think through what you might do for your A-B test, the idea is you're creating two variations on your code base, and you're altering one or more of the fitness function, the neural architecture, the morphology of your robot, the environment of your robot. And the idea in a good A-B test is it's not immediately obvious which of the two variants is going to help evolution evolve desired behavior for your robot. For example, if in variant A you have a jumping robot, and for variant B you make the motors 100 times stronger than they are in A, we're all not gonna be very surprised if your robot evolves to jump better in B, right? Adding recurrent connections, hidden neurons, adding a CPG, making an alteration to the neural architecture of your jumping robot, that's not so obvious anymore whether those architectural changes would allow evolution to evolve a better uh, jumping robot for you. That would be a much better A-B test. Make sense? Obviously, uh, in B, if you run your evolutionary algorithm for longer than you did in A, again, we're probably not gonna be surprised whether you get a better jumping robot. So when you come to comparing your A and B code bases, the idea is that you give both variants the same computational budget, this basically the same number of simulations. So if you run a population size of 10 for 10 generations, that's 100 simulations in total. You could in B run a population size of 20 for only five generations, still only 100 evaluations. Depending if you're making changes to your evolutionary algorithm and increasing the population size, that would be a valid test. It's not immediately obvious that a larger population size running for fewer generations would help or hurt. Yeah? Any questions about A-B testing? Okay, we'll come back to it on Tuesday. We'll go through, uh, we'll go through the final project subreddit module there and look at some of the projects and talk about A, A and B testing to again give you a better idea for what's, what's possible, what's reasonable, what's interesting, and so on. Any other questions about the final project? So far, so good? Okay, so um, we started in last time on our penultimate theme here in the course, which is collective uh, behavior. This in itself is kind of an open question in robotics. Obviously, we're starting to deploy larger and larger fleets of autonomous vehicles uh, on our roads. We're deploying larger and larger amounts of smart infrastructure, which you could argue is or isn't uh, a robot. Tricky to get machines to work together to do something that would be difficult or, uh, uh, difficult or impossible for a single machine on its own. We've seen lots of examples of perverse instantiation in this course that are embodied in a single robot. The robot maximizes our fitness function, but in a way, in retrospect, we would have preferred that it didn't. Same thing happens with swarms, yeah? So, uh, as always in evolutionary robotics, we started in on lecture 21 by looking at how nature creates swarms, and as usual, she does a pretty good job at it, but she's been working at it longer than we have. We looked at uh, flocking and herding and schooling. We ended last time by talking about uh, the Boyd's algorithm, which was invented back in the late 80s by a computer graphics researcher to try and create animations of these very, very simple agents uh, called boys that would produce relatively rich flocking behavior like we saw last time, where each member of the swarm is running exactly the same piece of code, which is a combination of uh, separation, alignment, and cohesion. This is now the standard in CGI for, for all things Hollywood. Okay. Back to nature uh, for a moment. Uh, we talked about uh, Alexander's book, The Principles of Animal Locomotion, when we discussed uh, legged locomotion and bipedal locomotion. We looked at the biomechanics of getting from point A to point B, and if you'll recall, we were always trying to strike a balance between four different features of how to get from point A to point B. And of course, as we saw, many species strike different trade-offs 
between those four different ways of moving. Here are two species that are intimately tied together in a coevolutionary dance. If lions evolve to move better, uh, gazelle, the gazelle, there is increasing selection pressure on the gazelle population to evolve a change in the way they try and escape from predators. What's the difficulty that lions face in chasing down gazelles? Lower top speed, absolutely. So a lion cannot move as fast as a gazelle. Good for the gazelle. How does the lion make up for this? It accelerates quicker. Absolutely, right? So anyone who has a cat at home, you'll watch it stealthily sneak up on a dust bunny and then grab it, right? This, cats are very good at sneaking up, getting very, very close to prey. And then because they have, a, in most cases, they have a slightly faster uh, acceleration. If a lion, in this case, can catch a gazelle within four seconds, good for the lion. If it can't, good for the gazelle. It's kind of a rough, kind of a rough deal for the lion. If you were a lion, how might you stack things in your favor? Four seconds is not a lot of time. Hunt in packs, right? So we can see that, again, like many times in this course, we've looked at sort of how the body provides a foundation for the beginning of the evolution of cognitive behavior. In this lecture and the next one, we're going to view this particular uh, building block of intelligence, which is recognizing that you alone are limited and thinking about or figuring out how to work together with others. Depending on the biomechanics of prey species, and this includes our ancestors as well, we are definitely not as fast as gazelle and all the other of our original prey species back on the Serengeti Plain. There is very good selection pressure acting on certain populations to figure out how to work together. And coordination, uh, coordination helps with that. Signaling and communication and ultimately language help even more with that. So in the previous lecture, we looked at language, which seems to be this abstract uh, purely mental exercise, and we saw some connections between the body and language. Here's another one. I can only move so fast. It would be better if I could work together with my uh, lion colleagues. We'll try and hunt down the gazelle together, but perhaps as we're evolving the ability to coordinate our actions, we might be able to do even better if we're able to signal to one another our intent. You go left, I'll go right. Yeah? Okay. This idea was explored in a, a, an older paper. We're again going to go back to the beginnings of evolutionary robotics, where in this case, the two researchers were not evolving behaviors for an individual uh, robot or agent. They're evolving, uh, they're evolving strategies for a team to maximize teamwork and coordination. Yeah. So the questions they asked in this paper, and we're going to look at some of the answers they came up with, is can we evolve, uh, can we evolve behaviors for a team of virtual predators? Can we evolve predators to work together? Uh, how might we go about evolving such behaviors? And if they do evolve the ability to work together, what kinds of strategies evolve? How exactly do you go about evolving cooperation? Okay. Again, this is going back to pre-physics uh, engine uh, era here. So they had a very, very uh, they had a very, very simple virtual environment. This is a simulated Serengeti plane, but it's a kind of strange Serengeti plane. Into this, which we'll talk about in a moment, into this plane they introduced five different agents: G for gazelle, the prey species, and in every simulation they ran, they introduced four virtual lions. The behavior of the gazelle is going to be fixed and they're going to evolve behaviors for the lions. The gazelle, like, it, like in real life, is going to move faster than the lions. And unlike this picture where the gazelle, uh, gazelles typically move about twice as fast as lions if both are moving at top speed, they really stack the deck against the lions in this case. The gazelles are going to move three times, are going to be able to move at three times the rate uh, of the lions. Okay. 
our, uh, our virtual savanna here is toroidal. So if we take this rectangle and we curve it into a tube so that the two long edges are touching, and then we take our cylinder and we bend it so that the two circles are touching, we've turned our, uh, we've turned our sheet of paper here into a donut, which means we now have an infinite plane. Yeah? The lions cannot run uh, the gazelle into a corner because there are no corners in this situation, right? It's an endless, endless plane. Okay, so the cartoons I'm gonna show you, it's obviously difficult to show uh, uh, four lions and gazelles running around on a donut, so we're still gonna leave it as this unruled sheet of paper. Just remember, uh, we're, looking, we're going to be looking at relative distances between the lions and relative distances between the gazelle and a given lion. But when we're computing distances visually on these cartoons here, remember to sort of visually wrap things around in your mind. Yes? Just so that they would change a little bit, are the, like the labels on the graph proportional to the actual size of the lions and the gazelles in the simulation? Uh, yeah, there are no sizes. The, the lions and the gazelles have no actual sizes. Okay. This is not a physics engine. You can think of these five agents as just points. In this, it's going to be when uh, a gazelle and a lion at the end of the simulation, if a lion is less than one unit away from the gazelle, that's a capture. Yeah, it's kind of arbitrary in this case. Yeah, good, good question. Okay, so in this cartoon example here, we have the gazelle at this position at time t, and uh, we'll just mentally run the simulation in our head. It moves in this direction at this velocity. Uh, and ends up at this position at time t plus 1. It's wrapping around because this is a toroid. And assuming that lion 4 is at this position on this virtual plane at time t plus 1, it looks like L4 is very far away from the gazelle. It's not, right? It's very close. Everybody see that? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Let's talk about the gazelle first, then we'll talk about the lions. As I mentioned, we're gonna fix the behavior of the gazelle B. B is gonna be a vector. In everything we're gonna see in this experiment, everything, everything, are, everything is a vector or vector operations in 2D for our purposes. Okay. We're gonna calculate at each time step the vector B as a summation over all of the vectors, the four vectors, that connect the gazelle to the lion by the shortest path. And I realize there's a mistake here. It looks like L4, that this is the vector connecting G to L4. It's probably something else around the other edge. Doesn't matter. From the gazelle's point of view, the gazelle looks at the, other, uh, looks at the four lions, finds the shortest distance from it to, the, uh, to each lion, which is the lowercase v. It sums up all of those vectors, which gives it an average heading into the lion pack, and then negates that vector to head in the opposite direction. Everybody see that? Why are we dividing by the length of the vector that connects the gazelle to a given lion? So it's a sum, but it's a weighted sum. you do bias for how close or far away the lion is. So if V has a low magnitude, if a given lion is very close to the gazelle, we're dividing by a very low number, and that magnifies the contribution of that vector on the new heading of the gazelle, right? A smart thing to do is obviously run away from the predators, Smarter thing to do is bias your direction based on whoever is closest to you. This is actually a normalization term given the fact that this is a toroid, not a sheet of paper. Most important thing for us here is the, the gazelle is always doing the same thing, generally speaking, but its actual heading and velocity at each time step can be different depending on what the lions are doing. All good? Okay, so since all of the predators react most str strongly to the one that's, re restract mo react more strongly to those that are closer. Okay. okay, let's talk about the lions. They evolved 
Remember that in this case, we're not evolving a behavior for an individual robot. We're evolving behaviors for a pride of lions. And they used a particular evolutionary algorithm to do so, which is genetic programming. Where did we see genetic programming before? Remember towards the beginning of the semester, we surveyed a few of the major kinds of evolutionary algorithms. One of them was genetic programming. No? Remember we watched the video of the uh, painting of Mona Lisa evolving to, to better and better match the actual picture of Mona Lisa? In that case, the phenotype was a bunch of colored pixels. The fitness of that phenotype is how closely that uh, array of pixels matched the actual Mona Lisa. The genotype that produced that phenotype was not a vector of numbers like you have in your code base. It was a tree that encoded a whole bunch of polygons and laid those polygons on top of one another. Genetic programming is a particular branch of evolutionary algorithms where the genotypes are encoded as trees rather than vectors. Yeah? So in this case, we're going to evolve behaviors for lions as uh, arbitrary trees. And these trees, when they are executed on board the lion, they're going to compute some vector operations. And we'll see some examples uh, in a moment. So let's create, some, let's create some random genotypes and see how that influences the lion uh, pride. Let's create at random a root node for our tree. We have a whole bunch of possible things that we can place inside that root uh, node. When we talked about genetic programming before, when we create a random genotype, we create an empty root node, we create a bag with all the possible things that can be placed inside, we shake up the bag, we reach in, and we pull something out at random. In this case, let's imagine that we pull out uh, last, I'll just write L for last. This is our genotype. We're done. This is the, we have a single node tree. Remember that the genotype, uh, the genotype here is encoding the phenotype or the behavior not for an individual lion, but for all four lions. So we're going to take this genotype and we're going to drop it into L1, L2, L3, L4. We're going to place L1, L2, L3, and L4 at some random position on the surface of our toroid. We're going to drop G, the gazelle, at a fifth random location and turn on the simulation. Question? So this over here in L1 is describing some behavior for L1, L2, L3, L4. Is this means can it distinguish between the four lions or is this? Can it distinguish between the different lions? Yeah, are we going to give like identical behavior to each one? Great question. For now, it's going to give identical behavior to each. They are all going to be running this program. They're all running the identical program, but they are not going to have identical behavior. Why? Their, their positions are going to be different. Their positions relative to other lions is going to be different. So depending on where they are, they're going to do different things. Yeah? OK. So let's imagine this. we've dropped this into uh, all four lions. And whenever we execute this at each time step, it's returning a vector. Yeah? So all of the trees, all of the genotypes we're creating, they have to return not a single number, but a vector. That vector indicates where the lion, that particular lion is going to go next. We drop this into L1. And it's supposed to return one unit in the direction that the lion went last. But the lion hasn't moved yet. So on the first move, or the first time step of the simulation, we generate a random normal vector, vector of length, length 1. Yeah? We get that vector, that random vector back for L1. We go to L2, and we execute this again. We get back a random vector for L2, a random vector for L3, a random vector for L4. And the lions move, then the gazelle moves. Each lion executes L again. In this, case, the, uh, in this case, the vector that's returned for L1 is the same vector in which L1 moved before. Everybody see that? L2 is going to execute this, and this is going to return the same vector in which L2 moved before. Same for L3 and L4. 
What do the lions do? And how well do they do at bringing down the gazelle? What is it, if we run the simulation forward in time, what does the lion pride do? Not back and forth. L is returning the vector in which the lion moved at the previous time step, at which that lion moved at the previous time step. Same direction at each time? They all move in the same direction at the same speed. Not the same to each other, but same to the direction. Absolutely, yep. So if we've got our Serengeti plane, I'll just do L1 and L2. So at the first time step, L1 moves in this random direction. At the next time step, uh, sorry, uh, at the first time step, L2 moves in this random direction. L1 moved like this before, so L1 moves like this. At time step two, L2 moves like this, like this, like this, like this, and so on. All the lines are moving at an initial random direction and then just keep going in that direction. How well do the, how well do the lions do it? bringing down the gazelle. Lions are going to go hungry, right? Not a very smart strategy. However, not, un not unlike your evolutionary algorithm, if you create a random genotype and run it on your robot, robot doesn't, doesn't do very much, right? So not surprising. OK, let's imagine creating a different, uh, let's, let's create a different random genotype for our uh, lion pride. We have an empty root node, we reach into our bag, and in this case, we pull out a G for gazelle, which means the at every time step, every lion is gonna compute the vector that connects it with the gazelle along the shortest distance on the toroid, and the lion moves in that direction. Seems a little smarter, at least the lions are moving, always moving towards the gazelle. How do the lions do it bringing down the gazelle? See a lot of shaking heads. Not very good, right? If you're a predator, if you're a prey, and you move faster than the predators, this is the best thing possible, right? Run away and make sure they all line up behind you. You're, you're, you're good, right? Not a very good strategy. OK, let's look at one more, let's look at one more example. <coughs> You'll notice that we have three different choices here that have zero arguments. So these are vector operations that, that don't require any further computation. They just return whatever vector is required. We also have some operations here, some vector operations. So let's pick one at random. Plus, plus requires two arguments. So we create two empty nodes. And we need to fill these nodes. So again, we reach into this bag. We shake it up. We pick some element uh, out of here. Let's pick. Let's assume we pick R over here for random direction, and we pick G over here. Both R and G have zero arguments, so we're done. Each of the four lions at every time step is going to uh, perform this computation. So vector operations, we visit R, which gives us back a random normal vector, and we sum it with the vector that connects that lion to the gazelle with the shortest path. All four lions perform this. How do the lions do? What are the lions doing? They're all going to go like, towards the gazelle, but like get some noise, maybe. Absolutely, right? So they're all kind of jinking behind, behind the gazelle. Assuming that they moved, well, they do move three times as slow as the gazelle, still not very good, right? This is a pretty tough task. Question? So the trajectory is always towards the gazelle. They might just change their glide at some one of the different sides of the rectangle or some distance towards. Uh, in, in this particular case, right? But we could, you could imagine creating a different, uh, a different tree in which they actually head away from the gazelle, right? There's all sorts of things they could do. Yeah. There's some fancier operations down here. We'll just look at one of these because uh, we haven't seen this before. So if dot, this is a conditional which requires three, uh, four arguments. So we've got four empty nodes here. 
And we can imagine some of these might have other nodes of their own. We compute the vector uh, here. We compute the vector here. We take the dot product between these two vectors. And if the result of that dot product is positive, we return the vector that's returned by this subtree. If the dot product is negative, we return the vector returned by this fourth subtree. Yeah? So over time, lion prides can evolve larger and larger and more complex trees that are performing more and more complex vector operations that combine uh, the direction you headed last, the, the direction towards the gazelle, a little bit of random noise to maybe throw the gazelle off. If you were now imagine evolving populations of trees where each individual tree in the population dictates the behavior of the pride as a whole. So we're evolving populations of swarm behaviors. The fitness for the lions, you can imagine, is how close do they get to the gazelle. How well do you think this evolutionary algorithm does? How well does genetic programming evolve a strategy for the lion pride to bring down the gazelle? We saw a few random examples that don't do very well at all. They're almost worse than standing still. It didn't take the investigators long to realize that even if you evolve this for minutes or hours or days, the lions don't very, get very good at bringing down the gazelle ever. Why? They're all doing, uh, and they're, yeah, not doing identical behavior. They've got the identical strategy, but they behave differently. They do actual different vectors. They, they move in actual different ways. Yeah, stra the strategies are all the same. Not, not too difficult, right? The gazelle doesn't need to do different things based on different lions, right? They're all generally doing the same thing. How do we try and give the lions a leg up? How did evolution give real lions a leg up, or real predators? You know, like try to make the pack have a strategy overall that has different, like have the lions do something that will uh, make the gazelle not have anywhere to go. Okay, possibly, right? So try and make it so the gazelle doesn't have a, a way to go, but. How did the lions do that? What are, what are they missing? In, in real life, yeah, absolutely, they could sneak up. In, in this case, our, our, our virtual Serengeti isn't very interesting, right? There's no bushes, there's no outcrops. They're, it's very difficult to sneak up, especially because they don't have any morphology. They're just points. It's a, it's a good point, but unfortunately for the lions, that's not really a strategy here. Okay, we could try and make, uh, we could make the strategies different for each lion. Each lion does something different. They become specialists. Maybe one of the specific strategies for having chasers and ambushers, but just to give the nodes the Okay, so chasers and ambushers. So now we're getting more specific. So we've got a division of labor. We've got two different roles. And one group, subgroup is gonna do one and one behavior and another group is gonna do another. I'm a lion in the pack. I know I'm an ambusher and I see my other three compatriots. I don't know whether you're an ambusher or a chaser. I don't know whether you're an ambusher or a chaser. So that strategy in theory makes sense if everybody knows who they are and everybody knows who everybody else is, yeah? Tricky to organize unless that's possible. Yeah? Okay. So the way that the researchers did this is this was A, actually. We just talked about A-B testing. We're actually going to see uh, A-B-C testing here. So this is A. The lions can see the gazelle. They can head in the direction of, gazelle, of the gazelle. They can move at random, but they can't even see their fellow lions. In version B, they're going to, in, in variant B of this experiment, they're going to do everything the same. They're going to evolve 
uh, strategy, they're gonna evolve strategies for lion prides, but they're gonna throw into this bag an additional four vector operations. So every time we create Every time we create a new strategy for a lion pride and we reach into this bag, there are three additional things that we might randomly pull out. Like, for example, n, which is going to return the vector that connects the lion nearest the gazelle to the gazelle. If I am the lion that's closest to the gazelle among the group of four, it's a vector that connects me to the gazelle. If I'm further away from the gazelle, someone else in the pack is closer, this is gonna return the vector that connects that lion with the gazelle. In essence, it's sort of like the lion being able to look around and see everybody and say, okay, I'm closest to the gazelle, this is gonna be my new behavior. I'm gonna to head towards the gazelle, or I see that Jordan is closer to the gazelle, there's a vector that connects Jordan to the gazelle. I'm going to, in this case, move in that direction. Could be a smart thing to do. Another one is our lion here, which is going to return a vector that points from me towards the lion that is, if I sweep in a clockwise direction, it's the first lion that's on my right. It's gonna return the vector that connects me to the lion that is the first one I see on my right-hand side. Let's imagine the pride, they're all running this strategy. They're all running the same strategy. What are the lions doing in this case? They're kind of going in a circle, right? So Jordan's on my right, so I'm going to head towards Jordan. There's another lion on Jordan's right. He's going to head towards that lion. Not necessarily a good strategy. Although, if you get a bunch of predators that are chasing each other in a circle, it's actually the beginnings of a pretty good strategy. But on its own, not very smart. Yeah. This is known as diictic sensing, which is diictic is relative to self. When I say, turn to the student who's on your right, I'm giving you a diictic command, yeah? If I say, everyone look at me, that's name-based sensing, me. Doesn't matter whether I'm on your left or I'm on your right. So diictic is who's on my right, who's on my left, who's furthest from me, who's closest from me. Everything is relative to me, diictic. Imagine we, evolve, uh, imagine we evolve behaviors for our lion pride in which evolution is able to create strategies for the pride containing these elements plus these elements. You think this pride does any better? How come? Okay, absolutely. So the lions are starting to do more different things, right? Because they're doing things relative to self, and self is gonna be different. Different lions have different positions. They have different positions relative to the gazelle. So you're getting a little bit more varied behavior. So it seems intuitively like if we evolve strategies for the lions with version B here, they're gonna do better. Okay, they can kind of start to, maybe they can start to coordinate, right? Because they know where the other lions are. I'm going to do something relative to the lion on my right, which is head towards the lion on my right. But as I'm turning to move towards Jordan, Jordan does something else. And now Jordan is suddenly the robot, uh, the, the lion on my left. What happens to my strategy? I was starting to coordinate my motion with Jordan. What happens now? If I'm executing this plan, what am I doing now? Finding the next, right, the next lion to my right, which is now no longer Jordan, and suddenly I've lost my connection with Jordan and I'm trying to coordinate with, with someone else. So diectic sensing might be helpful, but it's still kind of unsatisfying. You can, you can see how sort of coordination might intermittently appear for a few time steps in a chase, 
and then suddenly the lions lose coordination again, maybe they coordinate again. Hard to hold on to coordination. What could we do that's a little bit better than dialectic sensing? Give everybody an identity. So in variant C, they're going to throw this set of four additional vector operations into the bag from A. So A is all of these plus all of these. Yeah? OK. What happens to a pride that runs this strategy? Each of the four lions runs this at every time step. They're all following L1. What does L1 do? The vector that connects, I'm L1. The vector that connects me to L1 is what vector? I'm standing still. L1's not moving. What are the other three lions doing? They're converging to L1. How? How are they converging to L1? This is a vector operation. At every time step, it returns the vector that connects L3, for example, to L1. What is L3 doing from one time step to the next? L1 isn't moving anymore. I move towards L1. I'm closer to L1 now. So now at the next time step, I'm going to move again towards L1, but a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less. Right? They all converge to L1 and stop. Maybe not a great strategy, yeah? There are some smarter strategies if you combine those L1, L2, L3, L4 operations with this. What might those be? Can you start to sketch out in your head a combination of vector operations that includes name-based sensing that would lead to a pride that brings down the gazelle? Possible, but it's kind of hard to see, right? It's there. So the ambushers and chasers, that's a pretty good strategy. Still hard to see, yeah? Okay. Let's take this one step further. I showed you ver ver versions A, B, and C, which are the different sort of behavioral building blocks available to the pride. Remember that a single tree, a single tree, a single tree dictates the behavior of everybody in the pride. So the simplest possible thing we can do is what I just described. You have a population of trees. For every simulation, we take that tree out of the population. We clone it three more times. We take those four identical trees, drop them into the four lions compute how well the pride as a whole does, and then assign a fitness value to this tree. Remember, we're evolving groups. We're not evolving individuals. So the fitness value that comes back, which among the four lions was closest to the gazelle at the end of the simulation, that's the fitness for the group as a whole, which is this single tree. But even with dialectic sensing and name-based sensing, all of the lions are still doing exactly the same thing, which is probably limiting. So let's look, let's look at a different variation. In this case, we, have sti we still have populations, we still have populations of trees, but each tree has a particular form. At the root of the tree is now empty, and every tree has four sub-branches, which represent the behaviors which represent the behaviors for L1. So L1 can do this. L2 can do this, and so on. So as we evolve this entire tree, as we're evolving trees and gene the genetic programming is changing the values that are inside the nodes, adding new nodes, erasing nodes, we're changing now not the behavior of each lion, we're changing, each mutation operator is changing the behavior of one of the four lions 
in the pride. Everybody see that? Imagine, uh, imagine we have a situation where we have a population of these trees. How do we, how do we combine them to create uh, child, uh, child prides in this case? Imagine we have these four trees here. We can create a new strategy for a new pride by creating an empty node. And then when we go to create L1, we can copy and mutate some subtree from one of the surviving parent prides in the population. We plug that on here. So in this case, the new strategy for L1 for this in this particular pride is a randomly modified copy of the tree that defined the behavior for L2 in this parent pride. We would need to create a behavior for L2. We go back and we pick one of the surviving prides in the population that got a lion closer to the gazelle. And we, in this case, we chose this tree. We chose L1 in this case. We copy it in here and we continue. This is kind of like a form of crossover, right? We're combining genetic material, in this case, from three different surviving parent prides that did pretty well to create a new pride where some of the lions in this pride are genetically related to different ancestral prides. Everybody see that? The last way of evolving trees that they're going to look at is restricted breeding, where in this case, imagine we have these three surviving prides. We're trying to create a new pride. When we create L1 in this new pride, we have to choose, uh, we have to choose an ancestral L1. We can't use L2, L3, or L4. So we, cho we choose this parent pride at random, we take L1 here, we copy that tree, and as we're copying that tree, we make a random mutation somewhere, and we plug that new mutated tree in here. Same thing with L2, L3, and L4. Do they have to copy the separate tree to create L1 and L2? That's what it looks like. Yeah, you're right. It looks like in this picture that each of these has to come from a different parental pride. It doesn't. So we've got three surviving prides in this case. Imagine we flip a three-sided coin. We choose that parent. We could end up choosing multiple lions. We could mutate strategies from more than one lion in the same ancestral pride. Yeah. So if I am L4 in a given pride, my parent was also an L4 in some other pride, and its parent was L4 in an even earlier pride, and so on. Question. Ah, good question. I've, I've tried to hold back on what the potential benefits of these are. We've got three different ways now of evolving strategies for our lion prides. For each of these, way of, for each of these ways of breeding uh, strategies, when we mutate or when we create trees to begin with, there are different operations that we can put into those behaviors. It turns out in this experiment, there are nine possible uh, variations, three times three, right? We could evolve strategies using this set, using cloning. We could use that original set and use free breeding, or we could use that original set and do restricted breeding. If we do diectic sensing, we could do diectic sensing with cloning or diectic sensing with free breeding, or diectic sensing with restricted breeding. So we get a three by three or nine, nine different ways of evolving lion prize. So this is not A-B testing. This is A, B, C, D, E, F, however many that is. Everybody see that? The big question, of course, is among these nine, which is best? Before I give you the punchline, which combination of breeding strategy and uh, behavioral building blocks do you think led to the evolution of the best pride behavior? I feel like, <clears throat> like the main reason thing is restricted breeding. How come? Because I think that it has the potential to designate, to like really specialize individual lion roles. And so like if L1 is like the alpha or whatever, then like 
most likely, unless it's unless like a random mutation has a wild effect, like that fat line will continue to be. Absolutely right. So that particular combination, restricted breeding and name-based sensing, allows for the greatest specialization, assuming. That specialization in this admittedly very simple environment with these simple agents, assuming that that's useful, then yes, that combination should do the best. And given the fact that you mentioned that, let's just skip ahead for a moment. Where is it? There it is. Okay. You're right. So what I want you to look at here, we'll spend a moment parsing this table. We've got three rows and generally speaking, three columns. The three columns represent these different ways of breeding, and the three rows correspond to the different ways of sensing. They did a whole bunch of evolutionary trials with each of these different nine variants. At the end of each evolutionary trial, they reported uh, within that population of lion prides, they took the pride that did the best, in which a lion got the closest to the gazelle, and on average, if prides evolved with restricted breeding and name-based sensing, on average, those evolved prides could get one of the lions uh, 1.33 units uh, to the gazelle. Some of them, it was less than one. They actually captured the gazelle. This is still a pretty difficult task. Even some of the best, in this case, did not. So lower numbers here are better. So this is, this is indirect evidence that even in this very, very simple environment with just four lions, just one gazelle, gazelle is always doing the same thing. We've made lots of simplifying assumptions here. Specialization is a useful thing to do. In order for specialization to arise, however, you need to know which specialists are which, right? What this picture doesn't show you, and somewhat uh, frustratingly about this paper, they never tell you what actually evolved on this plane. What did these lions and these particularly successful prides evolve to do? It could have been that there is a quote unquote alpha lion that possibly moves towards the gazelle, but maybe at the beginning it moves towards the gazelle a small amount. There are vector operations you can put together where at the beginning it's moving a small distance towards the gazelle and over time it starts to chase, uh, it starts to move further towards the gazelle. Maybe that's one of the specialists giving the other three lions time to move around the gazelle, to move, uh, to move at a 90 degree angle, get quote unquote behind the gazelle, and then they also start to increasingly head towards the gazelle. If you've got some extra time on your hands, you can actually sit down with pen and paper with these vector operations plus these vector operations and actually construct such a scenario. Whether that evolved or not, who knows? Okay, so let me just back up for a moment. We'll come back to the results. As I mentioned, they did, uh, they did a bunch of trials for these nine cases. They did 100 independent evolutionary trials for each of these nine cases plus an additional 300 control runs. These are sort of sanity checks. So they did uh, 100 evolutionary runs where they just evolved behavior for one lion. There weren't, there weren't any other lions in the pack. As you can imagine, this lion didn't do very well. They did 100 runs of just a randomly moving lion, so there isn't even any evolution going on here, and four randomly moving lions. So a total of 1,200 total runs. These are details of the evolutionary algorithm. I don't think they, they matter for our purposes today. Okay, so uh, let's look at these three controls first. If we have one lion in which we evolve behavior for that lion, the lion on average is 7.4 units away from the gazelle. If you go back and think about the toroid, which when the toroid is unrolled, has a length of 15 by 15, you roll it back into a toroid, about the worst a lion can possibly do is be seven and a half units away from the gazelle. Poor lion, yeah? It's evolving to chase the gazelle and it's, the gazelle is uh, laughing at the lion here. Terrible, okay. It's, 
not statistically significantly better than one lion moving at random. It's not even worth trying to evolve a strategy if you're on your own. Four, on average, tends to do a little bit better just because by chance there's more, there's more of the lions, yeah? So even without coordination, that better to be numerous than on your own, yeah? Okay, so let's, uh, so we had a look at, at this. Four lions do better than one lion. Let's have a look at the clones for a moment. So in this column here, these were, this was the case where all the lions were running exactly the same, running exactly the same uh, tree. And you'll notice that in this case, name-based sensing here actually did worse than deictic sensing. So everyone's running the same program, but everyone has access to L1. They have a vector that connects them to L1 or L2 or L3, and they do worse than those that are clones of one another and have deictic sensing. Why, why did that occur? What's going on here? Exactly, right? We already saw an example of that L1 stays still, it moves towards L1, and everyone else approaches, right? Doesn't, doesn't work very well. Everybody's hobbled by the fact that they're running the same algorithm. If you're the chaser or the alpha lion, you should be doing something different from what the other ones are, are doing, right? Okay. We already saw this now. Restricted breeding does the best because there's specialization in this case. How this pride specialized, it's not exactly clear. Yeah? Okay, let's imagine that in a particular evolving population, uh, in, a, in, a, in a population of these evolving prides, L2, for whatever reason, is starting to evolve to be the one that's actually gonna chase and try and bring down the gazelle, and the other three are going to do something else. This works if the other three, somewhere in their behavioral tree, they have a reference to L2. So they're basing their behavior based on whatever the chaser is doing. That's good for the other three. But L2 should obviously be evolving something else. We're kind of, the, the investigators are kind of cheating in this experiment, right? They're giving L1, L3, and L4. They're giving it L2, right? In essence, their DNA is telling them L2 is the one that you should be basing your behavior on. That doesn't really make a lot of sense in reality, right? What happens in actual populations? It's not that a pride evolves and knows that it's always L2 that's the chaser. Like whoever's closer to the pride at this point? Could be, right? So we could decide who's quote unquote L2 based on who's closest at a given time, which is the other lions, well, all the lions looking around and making this determination. In a way, the one that's closest is signaling to the others. It's saying, I'm going for it. You do whatever you need to do, but I'm gonna go for it and see what happens, right? It's not explicit signaling. The one that's closest to the gazelle is not speaking up and saying, hey, I'm gonna chase after the gazelle, go get ready. It's indirectly signaling to the pride that it's going to do that which is fine, that works, and there are lots of examples of this in nature. What's required for an evolving population of lions or gazelles or whatever you have, what's required for that to actually work? For there to be a specialist, and the others know that that's going to be the specialist based on what that specialist is doing, what's required? Uh, right, so they, they like like we just saw, it might be genetically encoded somehow. Yeah. Could you somehow make it like bigger? Could evolve to be bigger, right? And there are examples of that in nature as well, right? I'm going to show you permanently what my role in the population is, just based assuming you can see my anatomy. So that these are all fine strategies, right? I can try and signal that I'm a particular specialist based on what I do, 
I'm closest to the gazelle and I'm gonna start moving towards the gazelle. So I'm behaviorally signaling that I'm the, that particular specialist or I'm signaling physiologically, I'm the bigger, I'm bigger, so just assume that I'll move faster and when we start the chase, know that I'm gonna be the one that goes after the gazelle. But again, in both of those strategies, there are certain things that are required to have evolved in the population. What, it, what are those things? If I'm bigger and I always go after the gazelle, it's not guaranteed that the others are gonna do the right thing, right? What's required for that to happen? Maybe you told me someone in that area said there needs to be a memory. There needs to be a memory, right? Or there needs to be some mechanism. It could be memory, could be genetically encoded, that if I see someone else that's bigger than me, I'm gonna do X. If I look around and everybody is smaller than me, I'm gonna do Y. I'm gonna chase the gazelle, right? So there needs to be a quote unquote understanding among all the members of the population about what a given signal means. Signaling and then communication and then language are tricky to uh, uh, evolve in a population because you need two things to happen and if you're missing one or both of those things, signaling doesn't work. The first thing is you need the signal itself. You need the biggest member to always go after the gazelle. If the biggest member of the pride half the time goes after the gazelle and half the time runs away from the gazelle, that's not a signal to begin with, right? It's not a reliable signal. Assuming we have that piece, the biggest member always goes after the gazelle, you also need the receivers, the ones that are receiving the signal, they're seeing the largest member chase the gazelle, that they consistently do what they need to do based on that signal, yeah? Okay, so this is a little puzzling. There's lots of signaling in the animal kingdom. It evolves, you need both pieces in place for this to evolve. How exactly does that happen? We're gonna look at the next lecture in this series that explores a case in which that exactly happens. So what we just saw was the evolution of coordination. What we're gonna see now is the evolution of communication. Strictly speaking, the lions that we just looked at, they're not really communicating. They're kind of on the edge of it, right? They're indirectly signaling based on what they do and the other lions respond appropriately. But we're gonna look now at explicit signaling. I'm, I'm going to chase the gazelle, do what you need to do. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, we're gonna actually go a little bit further back in time to 1991. This was an even simpler simulation than the one that you just saw. It's similar in certain ways and it's designed to test this idea. A lot of interesting twists in this particular experiment, which we'll talk about for the next 15 minutes. First one is that this is the first time that we're going to see agents or robots that have sex. We're gonna have males and females in this case. The males and females have different behaviors. Our, we, now we again have a toroid, we have a donut, but we don't have continuous positions. We, can't, we don't have an individual at x equals 3.2 and y equals 14.7. We have a grid world. Imagine we have a sheet of paper. We have a sheet of grid paper where it's a 200 by 200 uh, grid. We take that grid, we connect the two long edges, we bend that tube, and we touch those two circles together. So we have a total of 40,000 squares. But assuming that the ma a male, only males can move in this case, a male starts moving in a particular direction, he, he can, in theory, keep moving in that direction forever, yeah? There are no walls or barriers in this, uh, in this environment, similarly to the one that we just saw, yeah? Okay, so we've got 40,000 different uh, bins or squares. In every simulation we're going to see, they're gonna drop 800 females into random uh, positions in this grid and 800 males at 800 different other random positions. To start with, we're gonna assume that there is only one agent occupying uh, a grid position. We're not gonna put more than one agent into the same grid point when we start. 
So like the lions and gazelles, we're going to start every simulation with all of, all of the 1,600 agents, in this case, dropped into random positions. The females, in this case, are deaf and immobile, or biologically speaking, they're sessile. They do not move. So females cannot hear. They can see, however. Males cannot see. They're blind. They can hear. They cannot signal. They cannot send out any sound. And they're mobile. Seems already pretty odd. First of all, we have male and female agents. And then we're giving them different non-overlapping sensor motor abilities. Seems kind of odd. Where do you think these particular sensor motor choices are coming from? They're not that arbitrary. Uh, yeah, you have the concept that multiple males compete for a single female, which may or may not evolve under these conditions. We haven't said anything about the evolutionary process yet. We're just looking at sort of the base kit for these two sets of agents. There are a lot of species, not, not all, in which there are males and females that have more or less this, this setup. Females that move less, and they're trying to signal or bring the right male to the nest under certain conditions. And the males are moving around trying to find the right female. Right? So there is some bio-inspiration at the start of this project. They didn't specify in this paper which particular species they were basing this on. There's probably a particular species of birds that they were inspired by. They, they don't mention it in this case. OK. OK, so on this grid, uh, you'll notice some other details. So we've got our females and males. Um, females are going to signal. And when they send out a signal, there is a limited radius for their signal. Males that happen to be inside a signaling radius, they can hear that particular signal. If they're outside that signaling radius, they don't hear that, uh, that signal or that song. This particular male here, um, it's within the uh, signaling radii of both females here. The male is equidistant from both of these females. In this experiment, they flip a coin, and the male hears one of these two songs. So males, at any given point in time, they either hear one song or one signal, or they don't hear anything at all. OK. Let's have a look at uh, the neural network controllers for these agents. So we're back on a little bit more familiar ground. Both the females and the males have, they both have neural networks that have exactly the same neural architecture. They each have sensor neurons, motor neurons, and a hidden layer, hidden neurons. We see there's some recurrent connections, which is a reminder that Females might evolve the ability to remember things, and so might males, if it's useful. Uh, hopefully, you can see in this figure here that in the case of the female, the input neurons are binary values, and the output neurons are binary values. The input neurons, the sensor neurons here, are reporting the position and orientation of the closest male in her visual uh, range. So let's go back to a given situation here. Let's imagine this female here. There are no males in her sensing radius at all. So all of her sensor neurons are set to zero. She doesn't sense anything. This, let's, this female here, there are two males in her immediate uh, range. This one is closer. So she is going to sense the position and heading of this particular, uh, this particular male. There are eight possible headings, uh, there are eight p possible relative positions of the male relative to the female. North, northeast, east, southeast, south, southwest, west, and northwest. Eight possible uh, directions, each, eight possible relative positions of the male to the female. We're encoding this with binary neurons. So with three neurons, that gives us eight possible settings, two, two to the three, right? 
So we have three input neurons that are either zero or one that are reporting whether or not there's a male in the vicinity, and if so, which direction is that male relative to me? Everybody see that? Okay. Males can head west, north, south, or east. There's four possible directions that a male can head. So the female has a fourth and a fifth input neuron, where those two binary neurons together report the direction that that male is heading in. So if there's a male in the, this female's vicinity, she knows where he is and where he's headed. We take, for a given female, those binary values, and we propagate them through a neural network. And based on the synaptic weights in this neural network, we, the output neurons are lit up with certain values. And in the case of the female, those floating point values are uh, scaled to binary values again. Those binary values are the output of the female. The output, the female doesn't move, she sings. So this binary vector is her song. So far, so good? Okay. A male who is in a female's vicinity, that's what the male hears. So the males can see, uh, the males are blind, but they can hear. So if they're in the vicinity of a female, we take that female song from her output layer and copy it into the input layer of all of the males that are in her vicinity. We propagate those values through to the output neurons of the male. And in this case, uh, we, don't, we don't scale the output neurons at all. We just look at the four output neurons. Among the four output neurons, we find which of those four output neurons has the higher, highest value. That highest value triggers which of the four possible actions a male can perform. If the first of the four output neurons has the highest value, that male stays still. If the second of the four output neurons has the highest value, the male moves forward in its current direction. If the third or the fourth output neuron has the higher value, it turns left or turns right, uh, respectively. Everybody see that? So females can see, they can sing, males can hear, and males can move. Okay. Okay, so we have 800 sessile females, and we have 800 moving males. A given male, uh, if he moves into the cell occupied by a female, they reproduce, and we make one randomly modified copy of the male parent, which becomes the male child. We make one randomly modified copy of the female parent, which becomes the female offspring. So we have a new M and a new F. We take that new M and new F, the son and the daughter, and we go looking elsewhere. Uh, we go looking somewhere in the population. In the case of the male child, we find some other male and delete it. We find some other male, delete that male, and place the male child into that recently vacated spot. So this poor male that didn't reproduce at that time step was in danger of being deleted. In this case, it actually was deleted and replaced by the male child. The female offspring, the daughter, she goes to find some other random female in this toroid. That female is deleted, and we, re and we place the daughter into that recently vacated cell. There are many odd twists in this experiment. One is that it's, all of this seems like a lead up to sex, but there's no actual sex that happens. We're making, when we have a male and female co-located, we make a copy of each of these two networks and we mutate them. We are not genetically combining material between these two. Okay. There is, however, still an evolutionary advantage in this case for a male to find a female because it will produce an offspring. And there is an evolutionary advantage for a female to somehow convince a male to occupy the same cell as her that will trigger uh, her producing a female offspring. All good? Okay. 
Okay, this, this results in a very odd evolutionary algorithm. There aren't populations of 1,600 agents. There is just this set of 1,600 agents. There is not one generation, then another generation. This is known as a steady state evolutionary algorithm. At each time step of the simulation, each female, each of the 800 females, each of the 800 uh, males is allowed to update their neural controller once. Not unlike your simulations, at each time step we update the neural network once. The females do something, each female does something, each male does something, and in a given time step there may be no reproductive events. No males might have found any females. There might be 1, 2, 10, 20, 100 reproductive events for a given time step. And we just keep running that simulation forever. It's at steady state. There are always 1,600 agents, always 800 males, always 800 females. OK, what happens? Uh, again, this is a very uh, relatively old experiment. So they're reporting their results, not with a YouTube video, but with a table. In this case, they set the number of output neurons for the females to three and they set the number of input neurons for the males to three. That means that females can admit, uh, emit one of eight songs. Song one is zero, 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 and song eight is one, one, one. We can then watch, for example, over, in this case, uh, the, first, uh, the first 100 time steps of a simulation, and Every time a male enters a, female, a female's territory and the female sings one of the eight songs, we can record what the male did in that case. Not a lot is going on in these first 100 time steps. The males are wandering at random. Regardless of what song they hear, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, if a male is outside of any female's territory, the male by default always hears Zero, zero, zero. Yeah? Okay. So on average, males that hear zero, 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 about half the time they moved forward, or about a quarter of the time they moved forward, turned right, turned left, stood still. Same set of 800 males. Whenever they heard the song 111, quarter of the time moved forward, quarter of the time they moved, turned right, turned left, or stood still. It's not shown in this table, but on average, females were signaling randomly. Over these 100 time steps across the 800 females, they would intermittently change their song. What triggers a female to change her song, even if she's changing it at random? What causes a female to change her song? If a male enters her territory. If a male enters her territory or a male turns left in her territory, or a male moves forward in her territory. Remember that the female controller, whatever the song is output, is a condition of what a male is doing in her environment, if there is a male in her environment. If there isn't, all of the inputs for the female is zero, zero, zero. Okay. How many reproductive events do you think happened during these first 100 time steps? We have 40,000 total cells. 1,600 of them are occupied. The males are moving at random, and the females are signaling at random. What's happening? It's probably nothing. Not, not a lot, right? Very unlikely that any males are going to find any females, and unlikely that any females are going to successfully attract any males, because they're just signaling at random. The situation changes very drastically after these 100 time steps. Next Tuesday, we'll see exactly how they change. You have a quiz due tonight. You're working on deliverable three. We'll talk about A-B testing uh, Tuesday morning. Have a great rest of your week.